Art Museum. Affiliated stations present Escape. All of Fantasy. Inner Sanctum Mystery. Lights out. Welcome, weirdos. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Retro Radio, old-time radio in the dark, presented by Weird Darkness. Each week, I bring you a show from the golden age of radio, but still in the genre of Weird Darkness. I'll have stories of the macabre and horror, mysteries and crime, and even some dark science fiction and fantasy. If you're new here, welcome to the show, and be sure to subscribe or follow the podcast so you don't miss future episodes. And if you're already a member of this weirdo family, please take a moment and invite someone else to listen in with you. Spreading the word about the show helps it to grow. If you're here because you're already a fan of nostalgic audio and print, you'll want to email weirddarkness at radioarchives.com. When you do that, you'll get an instant reply with links to download full-length pulp audiobooks, pulp ebooks, and old-time radio shows for free. That's weirddarkness at radioarchives.com. Coming up, it's an episode from Lux Radio Theater, which ran for several seasons on different networks. From 1934 to 1935, the show could be found on the NBC Blue Network, owned by the national broadcasting company, NBC. After taking a break for a few years, Lux Radio Theater was brought back, this time on the American Broadcasting Company, ABC, from 1943 to 1945. CBS Radio Network picked up the show from 1945 to 1954, and then it finally moved back over to the National Broadcasting Company, NBC, from 1954 to 1955. Lux Radio Theater strove to feature as many of the original stars as the original stage and film productions as possible, usually paying them $5,000 an appearance. In 1936, when sponsor manufacturer Lever Brothers, who made Lux brand soap and detergent, moved the show from New York City to Hollywood, the program began to emphasize adaptations of films rather than plays. And that's what we have tonight, with the Christmas classic It's a Wonderful Life, starring Jimmy Stewart and Donna Reed in the roles they made famous in the film version. The role of Clarence the Angel is portrayed by Victor Moore in this radio adaptation. The film is my favorite movie of all time, Christmas or not, and I have to say this radio version is every bit as entertaining as its 1946 screen counterpart. This Lux Radio Theater broadcast used the original score from the film, the original script with only minor modifications for purposes of time and for the benefit of an audio-only production along with a host of effective sound effects to create a version of the movie that was colorized only by the imaginations of the listeners. Listen in as George Bailey learns the value of friendship and the impact one person can make on the world without even knowing it. Now bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the weird darkness as we listen to Lux Radio Theater from March 10th, 1947, and It's a Wonderful Life. Lux presents Hollywood. Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, bring you the Lux Radio Theater. Starring James Stewart, Donna Reed, and Victor Moore in It's a Wonderful Life. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. William Keeley. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight we bring you one of the season's most inspiring hits, a Liberty Films production that's been nominated for the highest screen award. Yes, It's a Wonderful Life. And we present it now with its original fine stars, Jimmy Stewart and Donna Reed. Jimmy in the role which won him a nomination for the best performance of the year. 
Also in our cast is starred that fine comedian, Victor Moore. It's a Wonderful Life is the drama of a typical American. Might be you, it might be me. He dreams of glory, he lives in hope, he loves and doubts, uh, and only providence puts a final value on his service to humanity. Our story starts before the war, when life was normal. Shortages were generally unknown, and simple luxuries like luck soap were abundant. I won't say that's the only reason people said it's a wonderful life, but I do know from the thousands of letters in our files that most of them said it's a wonderful soap. And they keep right on saying it day after day. In fact, the popularity of Lux Soap is what makes it possible to present such entertainment as Frank Capra's great production, It's a Wonderful Life, starring Jimmy Stewart as George, Donna Reed as Mary Hatch, and Victor Moore as Clarence. This is the story of George Bailey, citizen of Bedford Falls, New York. George Bailey, who more than anything under the sun, wanted to see the world. The wonderful, exciting world that lay somewhere beyond the limits of his hometown. Oddly enough, this story does not begin in Bedford Falls. In fact, it doesn't begin anywhere in the world. It begins in heaven where the superintendent of angels has just summoned an apprentice angel named Clarence. Oh, I, I'm really going down to earth, sir? Oh, how splendid. Yes. There's a very discouraged man down there, Clarence. George Bailey. At exactly 10.45 p.m., Earth time, he'll be thinking seriously of ending his life. Oh, dear, dear, his life. Now, I want you to stop him if you can. Now, sit down, sit down. I'll give you Bailey's case history. Sir, if, uh, if I should accomplish my mission, may I perhaps get my wings? I've been waiting over 200 years now, and, well, people are beginning to talk. Clarence, what's that book? The Adventures of Tom Sawyer, sir. I was reading it when you sent for me. Oh, fine book. Excellent. Well, you do a good job on George Bailey, and we'll see about your wing. Oh, thank you, sir. Now, listen. When George Bailey was a boy, two events occurred that you should keep in mind. One was when his young brother, Harry, fell through the ice and almost drowned. George saved him. Brother fell through the ice. George saved him. Ever since, George has had a bad ear. All that icy water, you understand. Yeah, bad ear, yes, sir. The other event came a few months later. George used to work after school in Mr. Gower's drugstore. One day, Mr. Gower's only son died of influenza. It was a terrible blow, and poor Mr. Gower tried to lose his grief in whiskey. Where have you been, George? Mrs. Blaine's called twice. What happened to her prescription? You lost it, didn't you? No, Mr. Gower. Here it is. Are you good for nothing? Don't you know that Blaine girl's very sick? Mr. Gower, my ear. You're hurting my sore I'll ear. teach you to loaf, you lazy brat. Mr. Gower, you don't know what you're doing. You put something wrong in those capsules. Shut up. Oh, I know you feel bad, but look, Mr. Gower, look. This bottle, you use this bottle to make up the capsules. It's poison. Poison? Don't hurt my sore ear again, Mr. Poison. Gower. Oh, George. That's what you deliver, Mr. Gower. All I wanted was to make sure. George, George. Well, Clarence, that was George Bailey as a boy. When he grew up, he wanted to go to college, but there just wasn't the money. So he worked four years in the Building and Loan Association. Building and Loan Association? Oh, I forgot to tell you. George's father was in the building and loan business. He and George's uncle, Billy. High ideals and low bank account. Anyway, George worked for his father and saved enough to see him through the university. That summer, though, he was going to Europe. Got a job on a cattle boat. Do a little traveling before cotton. Boy, oh boy, oh boy, it's hard to realize that my last night in the Bailey boarding house. We're sure going to miss you, George. Oh, I'm going to miss you too, Pop. Hey, what's the matter? You look tired. Oh, I had another tussle with old Henry Potter today. Well, I thought when you put him on the board of directors, he'd ease up. Well, so did I. I just can't understand a man like Mr. Potter. 
He can't begin to spend all the money I he has. I guess Potter owns about everything he wants in Bedford Falls, except our building and loan. That's why he hates us. Hey, George, can I borrow your tuxedo studs? Yeah, help yourself, Harry. Well, where are they in your suitcase? Well, I'm not taking us. Tuxedo on a cattle boat, you know. Say, where'd you get that suitcase anyway? Oh, Mr. Gower, going away present. And one of these days you're going to see that bag all covered with travel labels. Italy, Baghdad, Samarkand. Could have a pretty full summer, eh? I'm going to have a pretty full life. Hey, why don't you come to the dance tonight? Why, I'd be bored to death. Well, you couldn't want a better death. Lots of pretty girls. Hey, I got a hurry. I wish we could send Harry to college with you, George. Oh, we've got that all figured out now, Pop. He'll take over my job at the building and loan, work four years like I did, and then he'll go. Oh, he's pretty young for that job. Well, no younger than I was. <laughs> Maybe you were born older, George. Huh? George, when you get out of college, I don't suppose you'd come back to the building and loan. Oh, no, no Pop, I, 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 I just couldn't. I, I couldn't face being cooped up the rest of my life in a shabby little office. I, I, oh, I I'm sorry, Pop. Now, I... I didn't mean that, but it's just this business of nickels and dimes. I'd go crazy. I, I want to do something big, something important. Well, in a small way, we are doing something important, George. In that shabby little office, we help people figure out how they can own their own homes. I know, I know, Pop. I, I just wish I felt that I... I but I, I just feel like if I didn't get away, I'd bust. I... <laughs> You're right, boy. You get yourself an education, then get out of here. Oh, Pop, you... Pop, you want a shock? I think you're a pretty great guy. Well, thanks, George. I'm glad to hear it. Look, um, why don't you go on over to Harry's dance? You'd have a good time. Well, I don't know. Maybe it will drop in. Yeah, maybe it will at that. So, George Bailey went to a dance. Is that important, Joseph? Why, it was at the dance he met Mary Hatch. Oh. And three hours later, he was walking her home. George and Mary were feeling pretty good, Clarence. As a matter of fact, wonderful. Buffalo girls, can't you come out tonight? Can't you come out tonight? Can't you come out tonight? Buffalo girls, can't you come out tonight? And dance by the light of the moon. Oh, a hot dog. Oh, boy, just like an organ. <laughs> At <Gee> least. <laughs> hey, you know, you know something? If it wasn't me talking, I'd say you were the prettiest girl in town. Well, why don't you say it? I don't know. Maybe I will. Hey, how old are you anyway? Eighteen. Eighteen? Too young or too old? No, no, it's just right. It sort of fits you. Hey, hey look where we are. Hmm? Oh, the old Granville house. Yeah, i got to throw a rock. Oh, no, Donna. I, I love that old house. Well, no, don't you know about deserted houses? You, you make a wish and then throw a rock. George, but it, it was such a lovely old place. I wish I lived there. In there? I wouldn't live in it as a ghost. Now, watch. Watch this. Here we go. How about it, huh? Pretty good shot, huh? Broke a window, huh? What'd you wish, George? Oh, I don't know. Not just one wish, a whole hat full. Mary, I'm shaking the dust of this crummy little town off my feet, and I'm going to see the world. Italy, Greece, the Parthenon, the Colosseum... And then I'm coming back here and go to college and see what they know. And then I'm going to build things. I'm going to build airfields and skyscrapers a hundred stories high and bridges a mile long. And then I'm going to... Hey. Hey, Mary. What is it you want? What do you want, huh? You want the moon? All you got to do is just say the word now. Okay. The moon, I'll take it. Then what? Then what? Well, well, then you could swallow it and... And it'd dissolve like an aspirin, you know. And the moonbeams would shoot out of your fingers and the ends of your hair. And the... the uh, you, you think I'm talking too much? Yes, why don't you kiss her instead of talking her to death? How's that? Uh, youth is wasted on the wrong people. Why? Well, hey. hey, just a minute, mister. Hey, you come back here. I'll show you some kissing George, if you want to. George! Hey, Uncle Billy, look here. I'm going to kiss Mary. Watch. George, get in the car quick. Your father's had a stroke. What? what? George, had... get in. Hurry. Well, George's father died that night, Clarence. So, of course, George couldn't go to Europe. But that fall, just as he was ready to leave for college, the directors of the building alone had a meeting. They were going to appoint a successor to Mr. What was that you said, Mr. Potter? I said as long as Peter Bailey's dead, let's dissolve the building and loan. We don't need it. Now, wait a minute. Oh, you wait a minute. Peter Bailey was not a businessman. 
Ideals without common sense can ruin a town. What do we get? A discontented, lazy rabble instead of a thrifty working class. Oh, 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 I meant no disrespect, George, but... Oh, wait a minute there. Why my father ever started this cheap penny on building alone, I'll never know. But just remember this, Mr. Potter, this rabble you're talking about, they do most of the working and the paying and living and dying in this community. Well, is it too much to have them work and pay and live and die in a couple of decent rooms and a bath? Anyway, my father didn't think so. People were human beings to him. But to you, a warped, frustrated old man, they're cattle. Well, in my book, Mr. Potter, he died a much richer man than you'll ever be. I'm not interested in your book, George. I'm talking about the building and loan. You're talking about something you can't get your fingers on that's galling. That's what you're talking about. Well, this town needs this measly one-horse institution, if only to have some place where people can borrow a few dollars without crawling to you. Now, come on, Uncle Billy. What happened, George? Yeah, all we heard was a lot of yelling. Boy, oh, boy, you should have heard, George. Yeah, they're in there voting us out of business. Oh, who cares? I can get another job. I'm only 41. 45. Well, you get out of here, George. You missed your boat trip. Do you want to miss college, too? George, we've just voted Potter down. We're still in business. Whoopee! We're still in business! We're still in business! But there's one condition, George. They've appointed you to take your father's place. Appoint me? But I'm going to college. Look, this is my last chance. Uncle Billy's your man. Uh, George, you've got to take it. They'll vote with Potter otherwise. They said so. They even... I know George Bailey didn't go to college. That's right, Terry. He gave his, his college money to Harry. Harry went instead. But what happened to that good-looking girl, you know, Mary? Oh, George saw her now and then. Not very often, though, because Mary went away to school, too. Anyway, George waited four years more for Harry to come back and take over the building in Rome. He could still see the world. He planned to work in the oil fields, Venezuela. Except when Harry came home, he wasn't alone. There was a girl with him, his wife. George? Yeah, I'm out here on the porch, Mother. I just thought I'd get some air. Well, how how do you like your new sister-in-law? Oh, she's swell. Looks like she can keep Harry on his toes. Yeah, yeah, I keep him out of Bedford Falls anyway. What do you mean? Well, Ruth's father, she's, he's got a wonderful job for Harry up in Buffalo. Buffalo? Well, that means you... Yeah. You can't... Yeah. George, uh, did you know Mary Hatch is back from school? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Nice girl, Mary. Mm -hmm. Oh, stop grunting. Mm -hmm. Give me one good reason why you shouldn't call on Mary. Well, Sam Wainwright. Sam's crazy about Mary. Well, she's not crazy about him. Well, now, how do you know that? Did she discuss it with you? How do you... Besides, Sam's away in New York. Oh, and all's fair in love and war. Uh -huh, I see. Okay, Mother, I think I'll go out and find that girl and do a little passionate necking. Oh, George. <laughs> Goodbye, Miss Bailey. By the way, do you want any books at the library? Library? George! George, you go and see Mary. Do you hear? George, is that you out there? Oh, oh hello, Mary. Well, are you coming in? I just happened to be passing by here. Oh, I thought you were picketing. Have you made up your mind? How's that? Have you made up your mind? About what? About coming in. Your mother just phoned. She said you were coming over. My mother just phoned. What does she mean, Carla? I, I, I just happened to be passing by, that's all. I didn't... Well? Well, I, I'll come in for a minute, but I, I didn't tell anybody I was coming here. You feel I can't go out for a walk nowadays without you. When did you, when, you get back? Tuesday. Mm. When would you get that dress? Do you like it? It's all right. Well, no point standing here on the porch. Come on in. I, I still can't understand it. I didn't tell anybody I was coming here, you know. Would you rather leave? Well, no, I don't want to be rude. <laughs> Sit down for a while. It's nice about your brother and Ruth, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's all right. Don't you like her? Well, of course I like her. She's a peach. Oh, just marriage in general you're not enthusiastic about, hmm? No, no. Marriage is all right for a lot of people. It's all right for Harry and... Sam Wainwright, and you. For Sam? Mary? It's George Bailey, Mother. What's he want? I don't know. What do you want? Me? I, not a thing. Not a thing. And I, I just came in to get warm. He's making violent love to me, Mother. You just tell him to go right back home. Sam said he'd call you tonight from New York, didn't he? I guess so. How about some music? Uh, you know, your mother needs... 
You know, I didn't come here to... What did you come here for, then? Uh, I don't know. You're supposed to be the one with all the answers. You tell me. Oh, why don't you go home? I don't know why I came here in the first place. Good night. Good night. Okay, the way you're shouting, you think that... You think what? All right, I'll get it. George, on your way out, would you mind turning off the phonograph? I'd be very happy to. I've gone crazy, song. Hello? Sam? Mary! Gee, it's good to hear your voice. How are you, Sam? I forgot my hat. Hee-haw. What? Oh, I, I was just talking to an old friend of yours, George Bailey. Old Mossback George? Old Mossback George. Well, put him on. I'll talk to him, too. Wait a second. George! He doesn't want to speak to George. He does so. He asked for him. Why'd you call me? Because if you are, I, I'm in a hurry. I get... Sam wants to talk to you. Oh. Oh. Hiya, Sam. Hey, fine pal you are, trying to steal my girl. Now, what do you mean? Nobody's trying to steal anybody's girl. Here, Mary, take the... No, 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 wait, wait, George. I want to speak to you both. Tell Mary to get in the extension upstairs. He says for you to get on the extension upstairs. I can't. Mother's on the extension. <laughs> I we, we can both hear, George. Just put your head a little closer. Huh? Yeah, what? That's, that's better. Uh, we're, we're listening, Sam. Well, I have a big deal coming up. It's going to make us all rich. George, you remember that time you told me about making plastics out of soybeans? Soybeans, yeah. Yeah, soybeans, yeah. Well, yeah, my yeah. father's checked into it, George, see? And now he's going to put up a factory. How do you like that? A factory, huh? And yeah. here's the point, George. I may have a job for you unless you're still married to that broken-down building and loan. Oh, Mary? Uh, I'm here. You tell that guy I'm giving him a chance of a lifetime. Do you hear? He says it's the chance of a lifetime. Then give me that phone. Here's George again, Sam. George! Now, you listen to me, Mary. I don't want any plastics, and I don't want any job, and I don't want to get married ever to anyone. Do you understand that? I want to do what I want to do, and and you're not going to trick me. And you're... Mary? George. Mary? Oh, Mary, darling, I, I love you, Mary. George Bailey and Mary Hatch were... Yes, George and Mary were married. Mm. And they started off on their honeymoon in Ernie Bishop's taxi cab. Hey, where are you two going on this here now, honeymoon? We're going to shoot the works, Ernie. A whole week in New York, a whole week in Bermuda, the highest hotel, the oldest champagne, the hottest music, and the prettiest wife. <laughs> so you're finally getting out of Bedford Falls, huh? Then what? Then what, honey? After that, who cares? That does it. Hey, you know, Mrs. Bailey, I haven't kissed you. Hey, since George, that. there's something funny going on over there. Look, look over there at the bank. It looks huh? like a run. All right. Pull over a minute, will you, Ernie? George, let's not stop. Please, let's go straight to the no, station. No, wait a minute. I'll, I'll better see what it is. I'll be right back. George, please. George! In a few moments, we'll return with the second act of It's a Wonderful Life, starring James Stewart, Donna Reed, and Victor Moore. Meanwhile, here's our Hollywood reporter, Libby Collins, looking very smart to me, I say. Well, thank you, Mr. Keeley. You know, after seeing Paulette Goddard's wardrobe for Paramount's new comedy, Suddenly It's Spring, I just had to rush out and buy something new. Looking at all those lovely clothes was just too much for my self-control. Well, you look stunning, Libby. Oh, thank you again, Mr. Keeley. Now, tell me about the picture. I understand that Paulette's portrayal of the next whack is truly delightful. Oh, yes, it is. And Fred McMurray gives a perfect characterization of her wayward husband. Between the two of them, suddenly it's spring is a high-spirited comedy with emphasis on the romantic side. Well, naturally. <laughs> but really, Mr. Keeley, that wardrobe of Miss Goddard certainly will make clothes-conscious girls sit up and take notice. I'll bet you think so, too, Mr. Kennedy. Well, Libby, men seldom know much about styles. Well, what I notice about a dress is the general effect when a woman wears it. Some girls always seem to have that right-on-the-beam look. You know what I mean. <laughs> well, I think what you have in mind, Mr. Kennedy, is good grooming. Screen stars certainly put great emphasis on it. A perfect hairdo, fresh, beautifully cared for skin. Those are essential. That must be the reason Lux Toilet Soap continues to be a studio standby, no matter how often other styles change. Well, that's what Miss Goddard told me. She says her beauty facials are so quick and easy and work so well. She's never without a supply of Lux Toilet Soap. I can depend on it for daily complexion care, she said. I wish you'd tell the ladies in our audience how easy these Luxo facials are, Libby. Well, here's what Paulette Goddard does. 
She says, I cover my face with a fragrant Lux soap lather and work it well in. I rinse with warm water, then cold, and use a soft towel to pat my skin dry. Give skin quick new beauty, she says. Daily Lux soap facials do make skin lovelier. Recent tests by skin specialists proved it. In, in three out of four cases, complexions became softer and smoother in, in just a short time. A lovely Lux complexion makes a woman so attractive. I wish every girl who hasn't tried Lux toilet soap would begin using it tomorrow. That's sound advice, Libby. When nine out of ten screen stars recommend a beauty soap, you know it has to be good. So why not try Lux toilet soap, Hollywood's own complexion soap? We pause now for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Act Two of It's a Wonderful Life, starring Jimmy Stewart as George... Donna Reed as Mary, and Victor Moore as Clarence. Well, we're back in heaven again, where the superintendent of angels is reviewing the case history of a mortal named George Bailey. Clarence, the apprentice angel, is very eager to depart on his mission to the earth. Poor George Bailey... Oh, he's certainly in desperate trouble, Joseph. I'll go to him at once. Now, you sit down, Clarence. Sit down. We're nowhere near the point where George Bailey's thinking of taking his life. We're not? Now, uh, where were we? Uh, Oh, yes, yes. George and Mary had just started out on their honeymoon when they ran smack into the financial panic of 1932. In the waiting room of the building and loan, a hundred frantic people were clamoring for their safety. Hey, what's going on, Uncle Billy? What's happened? All those people out there. This is a pickle, George. All I know is the bank called our loan an hour ago. I have to hand over all our cash. Holy mackerel. The whole town's gone crazy. Bank's in the same spot we are. Our charter. Too. What about our charter? Our charter says we have to stay open until 6 p.m. The state can take away our license if we don't. How can we stay open till 6 without any money? George, where are you going? Out to talk to those people. Come on. Now, please. Now, please, folks. Now, just a minute. Just a minute. Now, please. How about our money, George? Where's our money? Now, come on, now, please. Well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Now, listen to me. Now, you're thinking of this place all wrong. Your money's not here. Well, wait a minute. Now, let me tell you. Let me tell you your money's in people's houses, in the Kennedy house, in the McLaren house, and in your house, and a hundred others. Now, what are you going to do, foreclose on them? I got $240 in shares. Now, let me have it. All right. All right, Charlie. Now... You'll get your money in 60 days. 60 days? Well, now, look, that's what you thats what you agreed on when you bought your shares. I got my money! Well, yes. Yes. Old man Potter's taking over the bank. He'll pay you 50 cents on every dollar. Then let's take our shares to Potter. Half is better than nothing. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. Please, folks, I beg of you not to do this. If Potter gets hold of your shares, he'll be owning this building and loan. And he's got the bank, he's got the bus line, he's got the department stores, and now he's after us because he wants to keep you living in his shacks and paying the kind of rent he decides to charge. Now, what? We can get through this thing, all right, but we've got to stick together. We've got to have faith in each other. My husband's out of work. We need money. I've got doctor bills to pay. I can't feed my kids on faith. Well, that's what you need. You still got some money? Hey, Mary. Here it is, George. You told me to hold on to it. Would have made a nice honeymoon. Bought furniture, too. Hey, now, wait a minute, folks. Listen. I've got $2,000. All right, Charlie, how much do you need? $240. Now, Charlie, now listen. Just enough to tie you over. I said $240. Okay, okay. Uncle Billy, give Charlie $240. All right, Ed. Now, how much just to get by on. Well, $20, I suppose. Now you're talking. Now you're Mrs. Thompson. How about $20 you? $20 will do me. Good, good. $20. Uncle Billy, pay it back when you can now. Pay it back when you can. All right, all right. Who's next? Who's next? Look at the clock. Look. Five seconds, four seconds, three, two, one. Six o'clock. We made it. Lock that door, you says. Quick. Boy, we're still in business, Uncle Billy. We've even got two bucks left. Hmm? George, there's a call for you. Okay, and then call my wife, will you? She's probably over at Mother's. Mrs. Bailey's on the line. No, I don't want Miss Bailey. I want my wife, Mrs. Bailey. Mrs. Bailey, that, that's my wife. That's my, uh, give me the phone, will you? Hey, Mary, ma- listen, Mary, I'm sorry. I, I, hmm? Come home. Well, what home? Well, 323 Sycamore. Well, whose home is that? What? 
Well, Mary, how can I... Oh, well, well, sure, all right, sure, I'll, I'll be there. Clarence, guess what 323 Sycamore was? His mother-in-law's house, huh? Oh, no. Number 323 Sycamore was the old Granville house, the one George threw rocks at and made wishes. Yes, sir, that's where they spent their honeymoon. That's where they started housekeeping. They were still living there two years later when old man Potter asked George to stop over at his office. Sit down, George. Sit down, Lou. Uh, have a cigar? Well, thank you, sir. Uh, George, you're a young man, married, making, say, $40 a week at the building and loan. Forty-five. Forty-five. Now, if you were some ordinary yokel, I'd say you were doing fine. But George Bailey is intelligent, ambitious. He hates the building and loan almost as much as I do. He's been dying to get out of town ever since he was born, but he's trapped. Trapped into frittering his life away, playing nursemaid to a lot of garlic eaters. Do I paint a correct picture, George, or do I exaggerate? Well, what's your point, Mr. Potter? My point is that you're the only man in town who has licked me. George, I want to hire you. Manage my affairs. I'll start you off at $20,000 a year. Twenty thousand. $20,000 a year? Are you sure you're talking to me? I'm George Bailey. Don't you remember me? The building and loan, remember? Yes, George Bailey, whose ship has just come in, providing he has sense enough to climb aboard. Well, but but what about the building and loan? Confounded, man. I'm offering you a three-year contract at $20,000 a year. Is it a deal or isn't it? No, no. The answer's no dog. Gun it. If you offer me a million dollars to stay around this town and play stooge to you, the answer'd still be no. Now, let me alone. Don't bother. <laughs> George, what did Mr. Potter want? Oh, uh, it's nothing. He just talked, talked. It's nothing. Oh, gee. Mary Hatch. Mary, why in the world did you ever marry a guy like me, anyway? <laughs> to keep from being an old maid. I was going to see the world. I was going to build things. I was going to give you the moon. What have I given you? What have I given you? Not even a new dress. Not for months. I... Gee whiz, I feel awful. So do I. Mornings especially. I could have married Sam Wainwright. Anybody else in town. I didn't want to marry anybody else. I want my baby to look like you. No, you didn't even have a honeymoon. And I promised you that you... 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 You what? My baby. You're... You... Be... Hey... Mary... Mary, you mean you're on the nest? Well, Mary had her baby, Clarence, a boy. You don't say. Then she had another one, a girl. Well, what do you know? Night after night, George had come home late from the office. Things weren't good with the building and loan. Potter was really bearing down on him. Then came the war. Mary had another baby by then. Oh. But she still had time to help out in USO. Uncle Billy sold war bonds. And George's brother Harry became a real hero. Shot down 15 planes. But George, what about George? Well, George was 4F, his bad ear. He was an air raid warden. On VE Day, he wept and prayed. On VJ Day, he wept and prayed again. We're, uh, we're getting... Pretty close to today, aren't we, sir? Yes, Clarence. You now know almost everything you have to know about George Bailey, except what happened that finds him down there at this moment, wanting to die. Well, sir, well... Well, today's the day before Christmas, uh, Earth time. George is pretty excited. Hey, Tilly! You, sir! Hey, look at the newspaper. Commander Harry Bailey, decorated by the president. That's my kid brother. The Congressional Medal of Honor. Gosh, George, gosh. What do you think about the 15 Jap planes? And the last one he got was just about to dive into a transport loaded with soldiers. You know what that means? He saved lives, hundreds of lives. Hey, gee, where's, where, where's Uncle Billy? Huh? Oh, gone to the bank, George. He's oh. depositing that $8,000. Good, good, good. Go. Who's that in his office, sir? It's that man again, the bank examiner. Uh-oh, oh, yeah. Well, good afternoon, Mr. Carter. Hey, uh, Telly, get the books from Mr. Carter. Well, you know, that's my brother's picture there, Mr. Carter. He shot down 15 planes, and one of them was... A... Well, well, Mr. Henry, a Potter come to the bank to deposit some more loot, eh? Sure, you old fool. How do you like the news in the paper, Mr. Potter? Just can't keep those Bailey boys down now, can you? Oh, uh, let me see that newspaper. Here, sorry I can't chat, you old thief. Gotta make a deposit. 
Uh, here you are, Horace. Deposit slip, bank book, and a very Merry Christmas to you. You too, Mr. Bailey. Say, you've forgotten something, haven't you? Horace, I've forgotten things all my life. Get a wiggle on, boy. But, Mr. Bailey, where's the money? Uh, what, what's that? You want to make a deposit? What well, certainly I want. Well, it's customary to bring the money with you. It's gone. Where'd I put it? Where'd I put that money? A terrible thing, Clarence. Terrible. Uncle Billy couldn't find the money because the envelope with the $8,000 was folded up in that newspaper he gave to old man Pop. I just don't know what happened to it, George. I just don't know. $8,000. Uncle Billy, the bank examiner's here, and it's not our money. It belongs to the depositor. George, what, what are we going to do? We've traced every step I took. We can't stand here in the street. Are you sure you didn't put that envelope in your coat pocket? I, I, I think so. Maybe, maybe... Oh, I'm no good to you, George. I'm no good. Now, listen to me. Now, listen to me. Think. Think, will you? Now, try and think. I can't think anymore. I, I can't. Now, where's that money, you silly old fool? You know what this means? It means bankruptcy and scandal and prison. One of us is going to jail. Well, it's not going to be me. Now, get out of my way. I'm going home. George, dear, what's wrong? You haven't said a word since you came home. Oh, well, that banging on that piano, does she have to just keep playing that same piece over and over and over and over again? I have to practice for the Christmas party, Daddy. What is it, dear? Another hectic day. Yeah. Yeah, another red-letter day for the Dad, babies. Dad, Murphy's got a brand-new car. You should see it. What's the matter with our car? Isn't it good enough for you? I'm sorry, Dad. I only... Run upstairs, Petey. See if Zeus is all right. Okay, Mom. Now, what do you mean? What to see if Zuzu's all right? What do you mean? Oh, she caught a little cold coming home from school. She didn't button up her coat. Well, what is it? What is? What do you mean, just a cold? Oh, George, the doctor said it was nothing serious. The doctor? Was the doctor here? Well, I thought he'd better look at her. It's this old drafty house. It's no wonder we don't all have pneumonia. We might as well be living in a refrigerator. Why did we have to live here in the first place and stay around this measly, crummy old town? George, what's happened? Everything's happened. You call this a happy family? Why do we have to have all these kids? Daddy, how do you spell Frankenstein? I don't know how you spell. You ask your mother. Where are you going? Upstairs to see Zuzu. Hello? Oh, thank you, Mrs. Welch. I'm sure she'll be all right. Who's that? Zuzu's school teacher. What? Oh, yes, the doctor says she'll be fine tomorrow. Here, give me that phone. George, please. Mrs. Welch? Well, this is Mr. Bailey. Say, what kind of a teacher are you, anyway? What do you mean, sending Zuzu home like that half-naked? Do you realize you'll probably end up with pneumonia just because of your stupidity? You know, maybe my kids aren't the best-dressed kids in town, but at least... Hello? Hello? Janie, will you stop playing that lousy piano? Cut it out! Stop it! George, for heaven's sake, what's wrong with you? I'm sorry. I'm... Janie, I'm sorry. Mary... I, I, I just got to get out of here. So that's it, George. Your short $8,000 in your account, sir. Oh, please, Mr. Potter, I'll, I'll pay any sort of a bonus. If you still want the building and loan, I... You say it I'll was let... lost. Have you notified the police? No, sir, I haven't done that yet. Harry's home... Oh, I come tomorrow. to me. What about your good friend Sam Wainwright? I can't get a hold of him. He's in Europe. What kind of security would I have, George? But collateral? Yes, sir. I have some life insurance here. A $15,000 policy. Mm-hmm. What's your equity in it? $500. And you want 8000 You once called me a warped, frustrated old man. Well, what are you but a warped, frustrated young man crawling on your hands and knees for help? Why don't you go to the riffraff you love so well? Ask them for help. I'll do anything, Mr. Potter, please. Please help me, Miss. My wife and kids... I'm calling the district I... attorney. Five hundred dollars. You know something, George? You're worth more dead than you are alive. Now get out of here. Get out. And all the time, Potter had the eight thousand dollars in his desk drawer. It's still there, Terrence. But where is George, sir? Where? Well, he went over to Martini's Cafe. He's had a couple of drinks, Clarence. He's just standing there, sort of in a day. Oh, God... God, dear Father in heaven, I, I'm, I'm not a praying man, but if if you're up there and, and you can hear me, please show me the way. I'm at the end of my rope. I, show me the way, God. Mr. Bailey, you all right? Don't drink anymore, Mr. Bailey. Please, you don't feel a good. Bailey, 
you say Bailey? Which Bailey? This gentleman is Mr. Bailey. George Bailey. George Bailey, huh? And the next time you talk to my wife like that, she'll get worse. It isn't enough she slaves teaching your stupid kids how to read and write. You gotta ball You get out of here, Mr. Welch. You hit my best friend. Get out. All right, um. Mr. Bailey, you you okay? Who's that? Mr. Welch, but don't worry. He don't come in this place no more. I'll get something for your face. It's bleeding. I'm all right. Please don't go away, Mr. Bailey. Please don't go away. Well, George left Martini's Cafe five minutes ago, Clarence. He's at the river now, on the bridge, looking at the water. Are you ready, Clarence? All ready, sir. Very well. Save George Bailey's life, and you'll get your wing. My wings. Oh, thank you, Joseph. George! George Bailey! Get away from that bridge! You hear me? George! In just a moment, we'll bring you Act Three of It's a Wonderful Life, starring Jimmy Stewart, Donna Reed, and Victor Moore. The popular theory about beautiful blondes is that they're content to be merely decorative. Our lovely guest tonight, Miss Susan Blanchard, completely disproves that idea. Besides being a hard-working fox starlet, Susan, I understand you're a wonderful cook. I really love housekeeping, Mr. Keeley. But most of all, I enjoy the training I get at the studio. It's work, but it's fun, too. You're an Easterner, aren't you, Susan? Yes, a native New Yorker. Mm, I thought so. It was the Broadway theater that inspired me to think of show business as a career. Well, that's interesting. I used to save my allowance and go to every play I could. One of my favorite actresses was Jane Wyatt. Uh Uh-huh. Imagine, Mr. Keeley, what a thrill it was for me to meet her right here in Hollywood. Jane Wyatt's latest picture, Boomerang, was made in the East, I understand. Mm Mm-hmm, yes. But she and Dana Andrews, who stars in Boomerang with her, were in Hollywood to see a studio showing of the picture. Oh, I see. Jane Wyatt is my ideal of a stage and screen star. So talented and so lovely to look at. Just as lovely in real life, too. She is indeed. It wasn't long before I discovered that she's as keen about Lux Toilet Soap for beauty care as I am. You know, I'm a Lux girl, too. We're glad to hear you say that, Miss Blanchard, because that's a very beautiful Lux complexion I see before me. Just right for blue eyes and ash blonde hair. Thank you, Mr. Kennedy. Any girl in pictures is delighted to find out about Lux toilet soap as a beauty care. Active lather facials are so quick and easy, and they really make a difference in your skin. Thousands of busy, attractive women have discovered that, Miss Blanchard. Daily Lux Soap Complexion Care does make skin lovelier. Otherwise, it wouldn't be the choice of nine out of ten screen stars. Lux Toilet Soap is all around beauty care for me. I use it as a bath soap, too. It has such delightful perfume, leaves a lovely fragrance on the skin. Thank you, Miss Susan Blanchard. I hope our audience will be seeing that lovely Lux Complexion of yours in a screen close-up one of these days. Now, back to our producer, William Keeley. Act three of It's a Wonderful Life, starring Jimmy Stewart, Donna Reed, and Victor Moore. (laughs) Numb with despair, convinced, as Mr. Potter said, that he's worth more dead than alive, George Bailey stands on a bridge, staring at the dark and frigid waters below. Suddenly, there's a splash. No, that's not George. It's Clarence, the apprentice angel. And there goes George in after him. Hmm. It's a few minutes later now, and in the bridgekeeper's shack, George and Clarence are drying off. You both sure you're all right? You, you want a doctor? No, I'm all right. I'm all right. Oh, I'm fine. This underwear, I didn't have time to get anything more stylish. My wife gave me this on my last birthday. I... Passed away in a... You... You what, mister? Mm. I see Tom Sawyer is drying out, too. Who? My book. I left in such a hurry, I brought Tom Sawyer with me. Hey, how'd you happen to fall in? Oh, I jumped in. I jumped in to save you. Jumped in to save me? Well, I... I did, didn't I? You didn't go through with it, did you? Go through with what? Suicide. 
Hey, it's against the law to commit suicide around here. Yeah, it's against the law where I come from, too. <laughs> where do you come from? Heaven. Oh, that's very fine. Right. Your your lips bleeding. Yeah, yeah, I got a bust in the jaw in answer to a prayer. <laughs> oh, no, George, I'm the answer to your prayer. Hey, how, how'd you know my name? Oh, I know all about you. Well, who are you supposed to be, anyway? Clarence Oddbody, AS2. Clarence Oddbody. Well, what's, the, what's the AS2 for? Angel, second class. <laughs> hey, I'm getting out of here. You may not need a doctor, but I do. Here you are, my good man. Hey, look here. Why do you want to save me? Because I'm your guardian angel, George. Oh, I see. Uh huh. Well, you look like about the kind of an angel I'd get. What? <laughs> what? Uh, what happened to your wings? Well, I haven't won my wings yet. That's why I'm an angel, second class. Oh, I see. But you can help me earn them, George, by. Letting me help you. Oh, uh, don't happen to have eight thousand bucks on you, do you? Oh, no, no, we we don't use money in heaven. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I keep forgetting. Oh, I see. Comes in pretty handy down here, bub. <laughs> oh, chat, chat, chat. As I found it out a little late. You know, I'm worth more dead than alive. You mustn't talk like that. Joseph will never give me my wings if you keep feeling that way. You just don't realize what you've done for your folks. Why, if it hadn't been for you... Yeah, if it hadn't been time... for me, everybody would be better off. My wife and my kids and my friends. Oh, this is not going to be easy. I'd all be better off if I hadn't been born. What did you say? I said I wish I'd never been born. George, that's wonderful. It's wonderful? What? The idea you just gave me. Well, you've got your wish. You've never been born. I've never been born? Exactly. No worries, no $8,000 to get, nothing. You simply don't exist. All right, all right, okay, all right. George, I can do things, strange things. I can show you the world, George, the way it would be if you hadn't been born. Hey, wait, hey, wait a minute, this ear of mine. Hey, say something else in that bad ear. You don't have a bad ear anymore. Oh, I don't think you're concentrating. Oh. Don't you see? You're not the George Bailey you think you are. You're, well, uh, you're nobody. Oh, that's the doggone thing I ever saw, that, that ear. Your that lips stop bleeding, too. Yeah. Yeah, hey, hey, what's, what's happening around here? What is this, anyway? I need a drink, that's what I need. What, what about you, Angel? You want a drink? Well, I, I don't quite know. Come on, come I... on, we'll go as soon as our clothes are dry. Our clothes are dry, George. Hey, this, so they are. That's funny. Well, look, let's get dressed and we'll stroll over to Martini's and then... Uh, oh, excuse me. I mean, I'll stroll. You fly. Yeah. Oh, no, I don't have my You don't wings. have your wings yet. No. That's right. I forgot that I can. A couple of drinks and we'll both fly. Huh? What'll you have, fellas? Hey, where's the boss? Where's Martini? Look, wise guy, I'm the boss, see? Okay, well, double scotch, quick, will you? What's yours? You know what? I just love some mulled wine. Huh? Heavy on the cinnamon and light on the cloves. Off with you, my lad, and lively now. Now, cut it out. Oh, come on, you. Just give him the same as I ordered. He's okay. Uh, Two double scotch. What about this place? It's all changed. All of Bedford Falls has changed. You're having your wish, George. You've never been born. Oh, there'll be lots of things you've never seen before. <laughs> oh, good. Somebody just made it. Made what? Every time a bell rings, it means some angel's got his wings. What'd you say? Ah, uh, look, uh, Clarence, I don't think you better talk about angels around here. You... Don't they believe in angels? Oh, yeah, they believe in them, but you know, it's just a little thing. Then why should you're... people be surprised when they see one? Uh, don't mind him, bartender. He's just a little fellow. He just never grew up, man. How old are you, anyway, Clarence? Well, next May, I'll be 293. <laughs> that does it. A couple of pixies, huh? Go on, get you, hear me, get. Where's Martini, will you Stop tell me? Stop asking about Martini. He ain't here and he... Hey, you. Rami, didn't I tell you never to come panhandling around here? George, look. Hey, it's Mr. Gower. Mr. Gower. Listen, Mr. Gower, don't you know me? This is George Bailey. You, 
You buy me a drink, mister? Just one drink, will you, mister? Pinky! Yeah, Nick. Throw the rummy out. Oh, no, no, please. Hey, bartender, that's that's Mr. Gow, the druggist. That rum head spent 20 years in jail for poisoning some kid. If you knew him, you must be a jailbird yourself. Pinky, here's two more. Get him out of here. Get up, George. Good thing he threw us in a snowbank, huh? Where's, where's Mr. Gower? Mr. Gower doesn't know you, George. You see, you weren't there to stop him from putting poison into that prescription. Hey, what do you mean I wasn't there? Look, look, tell me, what are you? Are you a hypnotist? George. Look, well, why am I seeing all these strange things here? Don't you understand? It's because you were not born. Well, if I wasn't born, then who am I? Nobody. You have no identity. Well, what do you mean, I have no identity? No papers, no driver's license, no 4F card, no insurance policy. Zuzu's bell. What? Zuzu's bell. I bought my little girl a bell to hang on the Christmas tree, and I forgot to give it to her. I've got it in my... I... It's gone. Gone too, everything's gone. But you've been given a great gift, George. A chance to see what the world would be like if you'd never been born. You're crazy. You're crazy as a bed bug, and you're driving me crazy too. Now look, I'm going home to my wife and family. Do you understand that? And I'm going home alone. Better not leave him alone, Clarence. Keep following him. Joseph, oh, I'll stay near him, sir. Poor George. He's seeing Main Street now the way it would be if he hadn't lived. The thing that's really shocked him, sir, is the building and loan office. Know what's there now? Pawn shop. What's he doing? Can you see? He's talking to Ernie Bishop, the taxi driver. He wants to go home. You better tag along, Clarence. Oh, I will, sir. I will. Come on, step on it, will you, Ernie? Get me home. I'm off my nut. Where do you live, buddy? Oh, now, doggone it, Ernie. Don't you start pulling that stuff on me. 323 Sycamore. 323 Sycamore. Yeah, hurry. I'll put a zoo to the sick. Okay, buddy. Hey, look, Ernie. I, I don't know what's happened. I'm going crazy or something. I got some bad liquor. I... Now, look. Tell me this now. You're Ernie Bishop, right? And you live with your wife and kid down You see my wife? What do you mean? I've seen your wife. I've been in your house a hundred times. What do you... We, we built it for you, didn't we? But... My wife took the kid and ran away five years ago, and I ain't never seen you before in my life, see? Okay, Ernie, okay, okay, just step on it. Get me home. Mary! Mary, where are you? Janie, Petey, Zuzu! Zuzu, where are you? This is just an old abandoned house, George. You have no wife. No children. Where are they? What have you done with them? Hey, I'll break that tin I told you. All right, up with your hands. Oh, Bert, Bert the cop. Thank heaven you're here. Now, look, why don't you be a good fella and I'll take you to a doctor. Bert, now, Bert, listen to me. What's the matter with you guys? Now, listen, it's that fellow there. He says he's an angel. He tried to hypnotize me. I hate to use my nightstick, but I guess I... Ow! Uh, run, George, run. He can't hit you while I'm Ow! biting him. George, run. My teeth aren't what they used to be. Joseph, help! Joseph! Joseph! Where'd they go, Ernie? Where'd they go? I, I, I don't know. They just disappeared. Parents! Oh, Joseph, I hope you don't mind my calling on you like I did. It was very irregular, Clarence. You're by yourself again. Where's George? He's at his mother's house, sir. Well, if George hasn't been born, he has no mother. Oh, he's being very stubborn, sir. He'll just have to find these things out for himself. But his mother, that's a terribly bitter blow to a man, his old mother not knowing him. You mean I shouldn't have let him... I mean you better find him right away. Oh, and stop fighting policemen, Clarence. I'm here again, George. My mother, my own mother didn't know me. If only Harry were here. My brother were only back from Washington. Your brother fell through the ice and was drowned at the age of nine. Well, that's a lie. He got the Congressional Medal of Honor. He saved the lives of every man on that transport. Every man on that transport died. Strange, isn't it? Each man's life touches so many other lives. Harry wasn't there to save them because you weren't there to save Harry. Don't you see, George? You really had a wonderful life. Don't you see what a mistake it would be to throw it away? Clarence? Yes? Where's Mary? Please, where's my wife? I, uh... 
I'm not supposed to tell. Tell me where she is. You're not going to like it, George. Where is she? I'll choke it out of you if I have to. Where's my wife? The library. She works there. She's just about to lock up for the night. So I, uh... George! George! Come back! Oh, there must be some easier way for me to get my wings. Mary. Mary. I'm sorry. The library's closed. Mary, it's George. Don't you know me? No, I don't know you. Let me go. Mary, please, don't do this to me, Mary. Please, help me. Help me. Where, where are our kids, Mary? I need you, Mary. Oh, get please. away from me. Help! Help! Help me. help me, Mary. I'm George. Mary! <laughs> Oh, where is he, Joseph? Where's George? I'm afraid I've lost him, sir. You knew you shouldn't have let him try to see Mary. Now they're after him, a mob. They think he was trying to hurt her. Joseph, I won't even get one wing, will I? You have one more chance, Clarence. Get over to the bridge by the river. I think George has seen just about enough. But, uh, but the mob... Now don't worry. They've lost him, too. Now hurry up. Oh, thank you, Joseph. Thank you. Clarence. Clarence! Clarence, where are you? I'm here, George. Help me, Clarence. Get me back. I don't care what happens to me. Only get me back to my wife and kids, please. I want to live again. Oh, thank you, George. Thank you, boy. I want to live again, please. Oh, God, please let me live again. George? Is that you down there, George? Now get out of here, Bert. Get out here. You come in any closer, I'll, what I'll let you have it. What the hell are you yelling for, George? Come on. George. George, Bert. Bert, do you know me? No, yeah. I've been looking all over town for you. Where you been? Hey, Bert. Bert. I'm alive again, Bert. You sure you're all right? Hey, your mouth's bleeding. It is. Hey, my mouth's bleeding. Bert, look at, look at the blood come out of there, would you? Huh? And where's Zuzu's Christmas bell, Bert? I had it right in my pocket. Here it is. Hey, it's in my pocket. What do you know about it? Hey, Merry Christmas, Bert. Well... Merry Christmas. Get in the car. I'll drive you home. You will, Bert. We'll do that. I turn the siren wide open, huh? Merry Christmas, Bedford Falls. Hey, Merry Christmas, old building alone. Merry Christmas, Mr. Potter. Yippee! Come on. Hey, Bert, come on, come on in with me, huh? What are the, these people, these reporters? Hey, oh, oh, Merry Christmas, reporters. Hey, Mr. Bank Examiner, Merry Mr. Christmas. Mr. Bailey, there's a deficit. I know, $8,000, I'll bet, huh? George, I've, I've got a little paper here. I'm oh, sorry, I, but... I bet it's a warrant for my arrest. Isn't that wonderful? Merry Christmas. Hey, where's Mary, you know? Uh, look at this wonderful old drafty house. Isn't it wonderful? Have you seen my wife? Where's Mary? Daddy, Mary! Daddy, 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 George, where have you been? Oh, Mary, George, oh, Mary, George, now, look, George. just let me touch you. Oh, you're real, Mary. Oh, you've no idea what happened uh, to me. You've no idea what's happened either. They're on their way here. Who? Who's on their way? Oh, the police department? I don't... Uh, the FBI? The National Guard? I'm alive again, Mary. Oh, listen, Mary, I'm alive again. Oh, yes, darling, yes. Now, now, close your eyes and, and come on downstairs. Oh, you... What is it? Can't open my eyes yet, Mary? What's going on here? Now, now keep your eyes closed. Now, I'll just walk you over here by the Christmas tree and... Well, the people I hear, lots of people. What, what is it? Lots of people. Just one minute now. We're all ready, Uncle Billy. Come in, everybody. George, look. Just look. Uncle Billy. Money, George. A laundry basket filled with money. Money for you. Mary did it, George. Mary. I don't, I don't understand. What money? What... People heard you in trouble, darling. These people, your friends, they've collected this money for you. The $8,000. Charlie. Hey, there's Mar there's Martini. Uh, Mr. Gower. Hey, how are you, Mr. Gower? Mrs. Thompson. Ed. Tom. Everybody. Huh? None of us would have a roof over our heads if it wasn't for you, George. Oh, Garth, this is wonderful. Hey, Mary, look. Look who's coming in. Mother. Hi, Mother. Hey, and Harry. Got Mary's telegram, George. I flew in as fast as hey, I could. Hey, everybody, a toast. How about a toast? Oh, good idea, Ernie. A toast to my big brother, George, the richest man in town. Good old 
Adventures of Tom Sawyer. Oh, Lord, there's something written in it. Dear George, remember no man is a failure who has friends. Thanks for the wing, love, Clarence. Clarence? Yeah, he's a very dear friend of mine. Daddy, this is well sick. Every time the bell rings, an angel gets his wing. That's right, Zuzu. That's right. That's right. At a boy, Clarence. At a boy, Clarence. Happy landing. It's a wonderful life so long as we can have such fine performances as we enjoyed tonight. From Jimmy Stewart, Donna Reed, and Victor Moore. Jimmy, I'd like to thank whatever guardian angel whisked you back from Texas for our show this evening. Well, that guardian angel was an airline wing, uh, Bill. <laughs> you were in Texas for the premiere of his picture, weren't you, Jimmy? Yeah, Frank Epp and I went down for five openings as many nights. Pretty good All down there in Texas, Texas yeah. Jimmy? Yeah, every one of them. The five premieres over Texas. You know, it's a pretty big state. Takes that many days. <laughs> Jimmy, I'm sure your fans were proud to read that you received an honorary degree from Princeton just the other week. Yes, how about that, Jimmy? Do we call you professor now? No, 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 no. It's just an M.A. Oh, Master of Arts? Well, I don't, it might have been. I don't know. It might be for murdering architecture. That's what I studied. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Donna has an honorary degree to her credit, too. L.L.C. What's that, Bill? L.L.C.? Well, you can see for yourself. A lovely Lux complexion. Well, thank you, Bill. Or rather, thank Lux Toilet Soap. It's a wonderful complexion care. I use it faithfully. With wonderful results, I see. Uh, what's happening next Monday night on Lux, Bill? Next week, we have another of the season's most successful films. It's 20th Century Fox's thrilling screen hit, Leave Her to Heaven, with lovely Jean Tierney, and a star who appears in answer to literally hundreds of requests, Cornell Wilde. Best, based on the best-selling novel of the same name... Leave her to heaven is the strange, dramatic story of a woman whose twisted mind and fiendish jealousy drive her to any lengths to hold the man she loves. Now that ought to make great listening, Bill. I wouldn't miss it for anything. Good night. night. Good, Good night, night, and thanks a million. <laughs> Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday evening when the Lux Radio Theater presents Gene Tierney and Cornell Wilde in Leave Her to Heaven. This is William Keeley saying good night to you from Hollywood. Here's a sure way to save on your meat and grocery bills. Turn in used pets, kitchen pets to your butcher and receive a generous price for every pound. The worldwide supply of pets is still desperately short, and every drop you save helps in the making of soap, refrigerators, and other needed items. So save and turn in your used kitchen fats. Donna Reed appeared through the courtesy of Metro Golden Mayor, producers of The Beginning or the End, starring Brian Don Levy and Robert Walker. James Stewart will soon be seen in the Robert Riskin production for RKO, Magic Town. Victor Moore will soon be seen in Roy Del Ruth's production, It Happened on Fifth Avenue. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers. This program is broadcast to our men and women overseas through cooperation with the Armed Forces Radio Service. And this is your announcer, John Milton Kennedy, reminding you to tune in again next Monday night to hear Lever to Heaven with Gene Tierney and Cornell Wilde. Surprise. When you bake and fry, Surprise. for your cake and pie, Surprise. it's your shortening by, rely on fry. Want fried foods crisp, golden, better tasting? Try Spry, the pure vegetable shortening that gives you delicious, better tasting fried foods. So digestible, too, the Spry way. 
Rely on Sprite. S-P-R-Y. Rely on Sprite. S-P-R-Y. Be sure to listen in again next Monday night to hear the Lux Radio Theater presentation of Lieber to Heaven. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Thanks for listening to this week's Retro Radio, Old Time Radio in the Dark. If you haven't done so yet, be sure to subscribe or follow the podcast so you don't miss future episodes. And if you like the show, please share it with someone you know who also loves Old Time Radio and Pulp Audio. If you want to hear even more, drop an email to WeirdDarkness at RadioArchives.com and get an instant reply with links to download full-length Pulp Audiobooks pulp ebooks and old time radio shows absolutely free that's weird darkness at radioarchives.com i'm darren marlar i'll see you next time for retro radio old time radio in the dark Music.